Hi everyone, so today's video is, well, really about what all the confusion generally is about when it comes to when you buy a plec, a log card, and what do, the hell do you feed it? So this is going to be sort of part of a series of videos that I hopefully do. Just look at the different diets and how you can cater for the different species and feeding them. And nutrition is so important. Anyone that has looked at nutrition of other animals, you'll know that there's so many vitamins and minerals that are needed um, in growth, biological functions, repair of cells, repair of anything in the body, reproduction, and the diet is so important for focusing it, the, well, for looking at. And what the big problem is, is a lot of uh, brands and companies get this completely wrong. And this causes a lot of issues. So today this video is going to be focused on herbivorous species. So herbivores, I mean mostly I'm going to focus on algivores. So these are species that will eat a lot of algae, but also ones which are off which or periplankton species. So that, that does include biofilms, bacteria. I am going to include species that might um, eat a lot of sponges, bryzo, although those are animals. I would say that generally if you're eating all fruits periplankton you're most likely more herbivorous given what you eat. And in this category you've got stuff like barium cistrus, um, barium, true barium cistrus, stuff about uh, barium cistrus andellus which is the gold nugget pleco, barium cistrus chrysolimus. They are um, they specialise in sort of uh, photosynthetic um, organisms on rocks and stuff like that. A lot of ancestors tend to be herbivorous. Um, generally, well, to a degree I would say all of them are. Some will feed on more photosynthetic life, so more algae, whereas others might feed more on bacteria. But this can be catered for if you look at the habitat of the fish, it might give them a clue what they're eating or what they can't there's no chance of them eating. So next it, um, is stuff like um, oh, um, out of let's go for hyperpotomina, you've got otosynclus, you've got hyperpotoma, these are sort of the real miniature species, lorcarne, stuff like phalloella um, and stereosomic these those are your twig catfish and um, twigs and uh, whiptails, stuff like that. Depends on that. the whiptail ones which live in the sand, that's kind of different. Uh, those are more um, omnivorous, carnivorous. So I've just edited the uh, view a little bit because I've got all this stuff on the table and I've got a little bit extra there and this is really just to look at herbivorous diets. So generally a lot of species that are herbivorous not many people might know and people might think that carnivorous species are herbivorous. So it's always worth researching what the wild diet is. And I do have a spreadsheet that I might, I don't know how I'd link it but I have got it in one of my Facebook groups that lists what is known about the diets of different species. Um, generally it's very difficult and a lot of things, although it might be in the gut, it might not be digested. So that bit, so the video on uh, wood eating, I do have, um, might be a bit old, but I do have a um, video on wood eating, which is a little bit of a deceptive thing because they can't digest the wood. So I've got loads of things here, and it's really difficult with uh, sort of freshwater fishes to get anything that is uh, fresh water for herbivorous diet. And I would say the most important thing is reduce the fish meal, reduce the insect meal, and reduce the krill meal. So that crosses off diets like Vitalis. That is really high in fish meals and so it will say here fish and fish derivatives that is not great that is really gonna not gonna be easily digested so herbivorous species are gonna have a digestive tract that is quite long and specialized in the bacteria and natural mechanics of it um, and the enzymes for focusing on 
what they're designed to eat and evolved to eat and a lot of these fishes are wild caught. So that's very important. The next thing is look at teeth. Teeth in herbivorous species are sort of generally they aren't as, um, they'd be less sparse and they'll be more sort of tightly packed into like a sort of I guess a little fan. It's really difficult to explain but I've shown videos of what it really looks like the teeth themselves. So while diets like that are high in fish meal might be good for fattening up a fish, they're very high in certain proteins and lipids that might not be easily digested. And in long term nutrition, it might not be actually a great diet. So there's other stuff. So you've got stuff like, this is an older one, I think. And I, it's probably, no, it's not out of date. So this is fish science. And again, I think, for memory. So this one brings up another thing, which is vegetable protein extracts and cereals. So both of these are put in a lot of diets. Yes, they are cheap to add into a diet. The only thing with, firstly, the vegetables is, well, vegetables and cereals as well. These fishes are very unlikely to be eating plants. They're eating algae and stuff like that, which aren't true plants. And really, they probably actually won't have the ability to break down these plants as well. Plants actually have, between the cells, a lot of cellulose, and this is really difficult to break down. So it's highly unlikely they're going to get as much nutrition. Cereals are also really high in fibre, and fishes use fibre quite differently to mammals. So it might not be as beneficial. And these are sort of two main things. I would say reduce the amount of vegetables, excluding if you could get really nutritious things. Um, generally aiming for the nutrition rather than to bulk it out. So generally, because fresh water, what you have available to you is so low, the best thing you can do is, and I have packs of these things, is seaweed. Seaweeds should make a large proportion of a herbivorous species diet because that's the closest you're going to get to algae because seaweeds are macroalgae. I'd avoid su um, stuff like samphire and there's another one. They are plants so they might not be as easy to digest. The great thing about seaweeds is how high in nutrition they are. They're often high in proteins and that's a big misconception that herbivorous species don't need much proteins. They're probably actually eating a lot. Bacteria are also likely high in protein. So there's also stuff like gnawing. You could add this to the tank, sort of um, either a clip or some sort of weight to hold it down. But just how slow lower cars can be, it might break down too quickly. So a whole mixture of different, as many different macroalgae as you can. And I'd avoid getting any that aren't pure because you don't know what's added to it. Also spirulina is added, I find the fish a hit and miss on spirulina, but it might depend, a lot of things that will say spirulina tabs aren't as high in spirulina as you'd think. So the powder spirulina as long as it's pure, and it is just high in nutrients, it's got um, vitamin A, uh, thiamine, which means that I guess if you were adding uh, anything rich in thiaminase, that might help a little bit in reducing the likelihood of getting a thiamine um, malnutrition, riboflavin, calcium, magnesium, iron, manganese, iodide. It's just got a whole load of nutrients and algae and that's why people are starting to eat a lot more seaweeds and algae. And also the next thing that is really difficult is that bacteria will usually, bacteria which is almost impossible to add to diet, and also animals will produce this thing called B12, as long as they are supplemented with it. And there's a big sort of debate, I guess, or misconception that certain foods contain higher amounts than they might do. Fish, so fish meals generally will be high in B12, but they might not be easily broken down, just the, a lot of these species won't even probably eat fish unless they're dead. Um, a lot of fishes will eat things outside what their natural diet is, like a lot of general animals will. So generally looking at, um, well, just supplementing that B12 in the right way. So stuff like mealworms, they are low in it, silkworm, pupae, and it's difficult to know whether those insects themselves have um, supplemented B12 in them. Cereals can, if fortified, um, 
have B12 in them. So I've actually got, so you can use crickets and you can get these chicken feed or um, for the feeding um, pond fish, you could get it like that. The only alternative is if you are making your own diet is using cricket, um, well, insect meal in general. So this is for human consumption, so it's pretty much safe. And I've fed a whole variety to different species. Obviously, as these are insects, they are fed on cereals. So that's another thing. Um, with fish being so high, it's also the environmental impact. Insects are generally considered more environmentally friendly. I'm not including krill. Krill are more crustaceans. Insects are crustaceans anyway. But um, krill has a massive environmental impact. Krill and many um, marine fishes probably are high in thiaminase. But as long as it's cooked, it should be at lower levels. So I think that's worth a get. But what I feed, generally to get a whole mixture of things in the right consistency and the right amount, is I feed a lot of apache. And apache is really confusing, I think, when you're starting out and look at all the different ones. Because they have funny names and the labels are kind of funny. So generally for herbivorous species, I would feed or focus on these two. So this is Rapashi Silent Green and I feed this more. This is slightly more omnivorous. So for really fussy kind of um, herbivorous species, ones that really don't suffer badly bloat, so uh, what's it? Um, uh, what was it? I've totally forgotten the name. I think it, uh, Parotosynchus epili, Hyperpotoma sp peru or robocop, they could be really sensitive to higher sort of more carnivorous diet, so maybe going for more super green, that contains, uh, I'm not sure it does contain any fish meal or anything like that, no, so this is pretty much a fully vegan, you could say, diet, whereas this has a little bit more, so as you go down, there is krill meal and there is black, folger, uh, black soldier fly larvae. I tend to feed this, especially to my ancestors and uncles, which are a bit more, because they're eating probably a lot more bacteria and stuff like that, they're a little bit more towards the omnivorous side. Whereas the bear ancestors, I tend to feed a lot more of that super green. But I te the good thing about this is you can mix it together. The thing is with diets, is diets are more than a spectrum. They're so ranged and it's so difficult to get the right diet. Um, especially if you've got mixed tanks. Really you want a tank where everything feeds pretty much on the same thing and if you're feeding different things, that fish, if the plex eat um, something that's not like for them, it won't cause any issues. So that's where I have an issue with beef heart. It's very difficult to digest um, mammalian and uh, Mammalian and bird lipids and beef, cows, they're mammals. So, yeah, so it's just looking at and go beyond gut contents, there's more than gut contents to it. And there's a whole range of different algae. The Pashi's really good for it, and I will research into New Life, New Life Spectrum because their ingredient list actually surprised with how good it is. But I would say consistency as well. A lot of these fish is feeding off, which is kind of like, you know when you get those sort of films in the tank? That's what it kind of is. Sometimes it's green, sometimes it's brown. Depends what species and taxa, group of animals and plant and um, algae are colonising it. So that's why I do like Rapashi in that way. So I think that ends the video. And... Thank you for watching and I'll film some more on the different diets. So thank you.